Word 31. Tantamount. T A N T A M O U N T. Equivalent. Having equal force, effect, or value. Tantamount comes from an Anglo French phrase meaning to amount to as much, be equal to, and ultimately from the Latin tantus, which means so much or so great. In modern usage, when one thing is tantamount to another, it amounts to as much as the other, adds up to the same thing. In his Dictionary of Contemporary American Usage, Bergen Evans notes that the words paramount and tantamount look deceptively alike, but they mean very different things. Paramount means supreme in rank, preeminent, as matters of paramount importance are rarely discussed on the floor of the conference. Tantamount, says Evans, means equivalent, as in value, force, effect, or significance. It is usually followed by two. Your statement is tantamount to a confession. Tantamount is properly applied to acts and statements, but not to material things. Word 32. Pariah. P-A-R-I-A-H. An outcast, a person despised or rejected by society. Pariah entered English in the early 1600s from Tamil, one of the languages of India. In the traditional social system of India, people were divided into classes called castes. The word caste is spelled C-A-S-T-E. Unlike in America, where there has always been a great deal of class mobility, downward as well as upward, until recently the Indian caste system was rigid and the pariah caste was one of the lowest on the social ladder. Its members worked chiefly as agricultural and domestic laborers and as servants to the British when India was a British colony. The third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary notes that until 1949, the pariahs were also known as untouchables. From this sense of social inferiority, the word pariah came to be used in English of any person despised or rejected by society, an outcast. Although pariah is often used to describe criminals, outlaws, degenerates, and derelicts, the word does not always connote lawlessness, abject poverty, or antisocial behavior. Young people can become pariahs at school if they don't wear the right clothing or do what is considered cool. In the 1960s, the hippies became pariahs in the eyes of the establishment because of their disdain for traditional values and opposition to the Vietnam War. And in the 1950s, during Senator Joe McCarthy's infamous witch hunt for communist subversives, many people who worked in the Hollywood film industry were blacklisted and treated like pariahs, social outcasts. Word 33. Germane. G-E-R-M-A-N-E. -E. Relevant. Fitting. Appropriate. Precisely to the point. Synonyms of germane include pertinent, suitable, applicable, apposite, and apropos. Antonyms include inappropriate, unsuitable, irrelevant, inapplicable, alien, extraneous, incongruous, and malapropos. Germane comes through Middle English and Old French from the Latin Germanus, which means having the same parents. When you have the same parents, you are closely allied by blood, and so related or akin. Out of this notion of family affinity grew the modern meaning of germane, having a close relationship to the subject at hand, closely tied to the point in question. The words germane, apposite, pertinent, and relevant are close in meaning. Relevant is the weakest of the group and means simply related, connected, bearing upon a subject. 
The chair of the meeting asked the participants to keep their comments relevant and to refrain from bringing up tangential issues. Pertinent implies immediate, precise, and direct relevance. Emily made several pertinent suggestions during the meeting that helped us focus on the problem. Apposite implies relevance that is particularly appropriate, timely, or suitable to the occasion. Emily made some apposite observations about the competition that made us reconsider our marketing strategy. Our keyword, germane, implies a close connection or natural relationship that is highly fitting or appropriate. Emily also presented a great deal of germane information in her report. The judge chided the defense attorney for voicing opinions that were not germane to the case. Word 34. Licentious. L-I-C-E-N-T-I-O-U-S. Sexually abandoned. Lacking moral restraint. Especially in sexual conduct. Apparently, there is something sensual about the letter L, because there are no fewer than nine synonyms of licentious that begin with L. Lewd, loose, lustful, lecherous, lascivious, libertine, lubricious, licorice, and libidinous. Additional synonyms of licentious, and believe me, I'm selecting only the more challenging ones, include body, wanton, ribald, prurient, debauched, dissolute, salacious, and concupiscent. Had enough sexy words? All right, here are three antonyms of licentious to quell your lust. Pure, chaste, and virtuous. Licentious comes from the Latin licentia, freedom, leave, liberty, the source also of the English word license. By derivation, licentious means taking license, and the word implies doing something one is not supposed to do, especially something sexually immoral. Dictionaries will tell you that licentious may be used to mean unrestrained by law, morality, or rules of correctness or propriety, as a licentious poet or a licentious rap musician. But the truth is that in current usage, licentious almost always connotes unrestrained sexuality. Licentious poets write lewd or lustful poems, and licentious rap musicians hip-hop through their sexual escapades. A licentious person is someone who displays a lack of moral restraint, word 35. Superannuated. S-U-P-E-R-A-N-N-U-A-T-E-D. Retired because of age, weakness, or ineffectiveness. Old and worn out. Outdated. Outmoded. Obsolete. Synonyms of superannuated include time-worn, antiquated, decrepit, passé, and effete, E-F-F-E-T-E. Superannuated combines the prefix super, meaning beyond, with the Latin annum, a year, and by derivation means beyond the useful years. That which is superannuated is too old for use, work, or service. The word may be used of a person who has reached the age of retirement or of anything that has outlived its usefulness, that is old and worn out, as a superannuated car, a superannuated custom, a superannuated technology, or a superannuated idea. Word 36 Egregious. E G R E G I O U S. Conspicuously bad. Remarkable or outstanding for some undesirable or offensive quality. Synonyms of egregious include flagrant, outrageous, excessive, shocking, gross, monstrous, notorious, grievous 
and arrant, a r r a n t. Egregious comes from the Latin egregious, not of the common herd, and therefore select or outstanding. Egregious was once used to mean outstanding or remarkable, but this sense is long obsolete. And for at least three hundred years, the word has most often been used to mean outstanding or remarkable in a bad way, conspicuously bad, offensive, or undesirable. When you think of how many remarkably bad things there are in the world, it's surprising that egregious isn't used more often. Here are a few possible applications: an egregious crime, an egregious lie. An egregious insult, an egregious fool, an egregious oversight, an egregious mistake, and an egregious breach of human rights. Word thirty-seven. Vapid. V a p i d. Lifeless, dull, boring, flat, stale, lacking spirit, interest. Or flavor. Synonyms of vapid include unsavory, insipid, unpalatable, trite, prosaic (word sixteen of level four), pedestrian, and jejune (j e j u n e). Antonyms include lively, vigorous, vivid, animated, robust. Vivacious and emphatic. Vapid comes from the Latin vapidus, which means spiritless, spoiled, flat. The word has remained true to its Latin root, and in modern usage, vapid still applies to that which is lifeless, boring, or stale. Today, we speak of vapid conversation, vapid beer, a vapid remark, or a vapid look in a person's eyes. Word thirty-eight, crotchet. C r o t c h e t. An odd notion or whim that one clings to stubbornly. The corresponding adjective is crotchety. A crotchety person is full of crotchets and therefore stubbornly eccentric. Crotchety is often applied to cantankerous old people who are set in their eccentric ways. Crotchet comes from a Middle English word meaning a staff with a hook at the end. It is related to the familiar word crochet, spelled C R O C H E T, the form of needlework in which thread is looped with a hooked needle. Crotchet was once used to mean a reaping hook or a hook-like instrument. In modern usage, however, the most common meaning of crotchet is an odd notion or whim that hooks you, or that you cling to stubbornly, as if with a hook. Webster's New World Dictionary, third edition, says that crotchet implies great eccentricity and connotes stubbornness in opposition to prevailing thought, usually on some insignificant point. A crotchet may appear insignificant to others. But if it's your crotchet, it's far from trivial. Think of all the eccentric people you know, young or old, who cling to some odd notion or peculiar way of doing something, and you will see that to the people who hold them, crotchets are heartfelt convictions. In the writer's art, James J. Kilpatrick includes a long chapter in which he lists, without excuses or apology, one hundred of his crotchets about usage. Every one, writes Kilpatrick, is as dear to me as Audrey, the country wench, was dear to Touchstone. She was an ill-favored thing, sir, but his own. If I am tetchy about the placement of only, that's it. I'm crotchety. And before your verbally advantaged guide gets crotchety about usage too, let's move on to the next word. Word thirty-nine, epigraph. E p i g r a p h, an inscription, especially an inscription on a building or monument, or a brief quotation at the beginning of a literary composition that suggests or is germane to its theme. 
The words epigraph, epigram, and epitaph are close in meaning but sharply distinguished in usage. An epitaph, spelled E P I T A P H, is an inscription on a gravestone or tomb in memory of the person buried. In the Devil's Dictionary, a classic work of satirical lexicography, the acerbic and crotchety humorist Ambrose Bierce defined epitaph as an inscription on a tomb, showing that virtues acquired by death have a retroactive effect. Dorothy Parker, another American writer famous for her quick, mordant wit, once proposed these two epitaphs for herself: "Excuse my dust." And this is on me. The word epigram, spelled E P I G R A M, has two meanings. Originally, it referred to a short, witty poem. For example, this two-line ditty by Ogden Nash: "I like eels, sept as meals." Later, epigram also came to mean a short, pointed saying that displays terse wit or a clever twist of thought. One of the greatest epigrammatists or writer of epigrams who ever lived was the 19th-century poet and playwright Oscar Wilde. Here are three examples of Wilde's epigrams. When people agree with me, I always feel that I must be wrong. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. A cynic is a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Our key word epigraph is formed from the prefix epi, meaning on or above, and the Greek verb graphein to write. This Greek verb has influenced many English words, including electrocardiograph, an instrument for recording the beating of the heart, orthography, correct spelling, polygraph, otherwise known as a lie detector, and graphology. The study of handwriting. Whenever you see a word containing graph, spelled G R A P H, you can reasonably assume that it has something to do with writing. An epigraph, by derivation, means a writing on or above something, hence an inscription. When you see words engraved on a building, a monument, or a statue, that's an epigraph. When you see a brief quotation placed at the beginning of a book, a chapter, a poem, or the like, that is also an epigraph. Word forty. Expatiate. E x p a t i a t e. To elaborate, speak or write at great length. Synonyms of expatiate include discourse. Expound, and descant, d e s c a n t. The verb to expatiate comes from the Latin expatiari, to wander. Expatiate originally meant to wander or walk about freely, but this sense is now rare. In current usage, expatiate suggests wandering at will over a subject. When you expatiate on something, you elaborate, go into detail, speak or write about it at great length. The corresponding noun is expatiation. Let's review the ten key words you've just learned by playing. One of these definitions doesn't fit the word. I will say a word followed by three apparent synonyms. But only two of those three words or phrases will be true synonyms. One will be unrelated in meaning. You have to decide which one of the three ostensible synonyms or phrases doesn't fit the word. Are you ready? Here we go. Tantamount means equal, balanced, equivalent. Balanced doesn't fit. Tantamount means equivalent. Having equal force, effect, or value. A pariah is an unlucky person, a social reject, an outcast.
An unlucky person doesn't fit. A pariah is an outcast, a person despised or rejected by society. Germain means fitting, relevant, interesting. Interesting doesn't fit. Germain means relevant, fitting, appropriate, precisely to the point. Licentious means sexually immoral, sexually inhibited, sexually abandoned. Sexually inhibited doesn't fit. Licentious means sexually abandoned, lacking moral restraint, especially in sexual conduct. Superannuated means old and worn out, highly exaggerated, obsolete. Highly exaggerated doesn't fit. Superannuated means retired because of age, weakness, or ineffectiveness, old and worn out, outdated, outmoded, obsolete. Egregious means conspicuously false, conspicuously offensive, conspicuously bad. Conspicuously false doesn't fit. Egregious means conspicuously bad, remarkable or outstanding for some undesirable or offensive quality. Vapid means lifeless, boring, unpleasant. Unpleasant doesn't fit. Vapid means lifeless, dull, boring, flat, stale, lacking spirit, interest, or flavor. A crotchet is a bad idea, an odd whim, a stubborn notion. Bad idea doesn't fit. A crotchet is an odd notion or whim that one clings to stubbornly. An epigraph is an inscription on a building, a quotation at the beginning of a book, something written on a gravestone. Something written on a gravestone doesn't fit. An epitaph is something written on a gravestone. An epigraph is an inscription on a building or monument, or a brief quotation at the beginning of a literary composition. To expatiate means to go into detail to explain briefly, to elaborate. To explain briefly doesn't fit. To expatiate means to elaborate, go into detail, speak or write at great length. That concludes the review for this section. Let's return now to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the final 10 keywords in level eight. Word 41, sinecure. S-I-N-E-C-U-R-E. -E. A position that provides a good income or salary, but that requires little or no work. In colloquial terms, a cushy job. Sinecure comes from the Latin phrase beneficium sine cura, which means a benefice without cure. And what does that mean, you ask? A benefice is an endowed church position or office that provides a member of the clergy with a fixed income or guaranteed living. A benefice without cure means a paid position for a member of the clergy that does not require pastoral work, in other words, the curing of souls. Pastors, vicars, rectors, and the like who were granted sinecures by their church did not have a congregation, and they were paid well to do little or nothing. Sinecure is such a useful word that it was soon adopted by the laity to mean any position or office that has no specific duties or work attached to it, but that provides an income or emolument. The traditional pronunciation, sinecure, is listed first in all current dictionaries, but the word may also be pronounced Sinecure, word 42. Predilection, P-R-E-D-I-L-E-C-T-I-O-N. A preference, partiality, preconceived liking, an inclination or disposition to favor something. 
Synonyms of predilection include fondness, leaning, bias, prejudice, predisposition, affinity, word 46 of level 4, penchant, word 9 of level 3, propensity, and proclivity. Predilection comes through French from the medieval Latin verb prédiligere, to prefer. Unlike the words bias and prejudice, which are often used negatively, predilection has either a neutral or positive connotation and is used as a stronger synonym of preference and partiality. According to the third edition of Webster's New World Dictionary, a predilection is a preconceived liking formed as a result of one's background, temperament, etc., that inclines one toward a particular preference. You can have a predilection for anything you are naturally partial to or inclined to like, as a predilection for ice hockey, a predilection for solving crossword puzzles, a predilection for country music, or a predilection for Italian word 43. Imbroglio I-M-B-R-O-G-L-I-O a complicated or intricate situation, a difficult, perplexing state of affairs. Also, a misunderstanding or disagreement of a complicated and confusing nature. Synonyms of imbroglio include entanglement, embroilment, predicament, and quandary. Imbroglio comes through Italian and Old French from Latin, and means by derivation to entangle, confuse, mix up, embroil. When imbroglio entered English in the mid-1700s, it meant a confused heap, but this sense is now rare. The great Oxford English Dictionary shows that by the early 1800s, imbroglio had come to mean a state of great confusion and entanglement, a complicated or difficult situation a confused misunderstanding or disagreement. The unraveling of an imbroglio is a common plot in many plays, novels, and operas, but there are plenty of imbroglios in real life as well. Open the newspaper on any given day and you will find stories of political imbroglios, financial imbroglios, word 44. Ineffable. I-N-E-F-F a-B-L-E Inexpressible Unable to be expressed or described in words Synonyms of ineffable include unutterable, unspeakable, and indescribable. Ineffable comes from the Latin ineffabilis, which means unutterable, not able to be spoken. Once upon a prudish time, when Thomas Bowdler was Bowdlerizing Shakespeare and the Bible, and Anthony Comstock was committing Comstockery on the U.S. mail, the more refined members of polite society would call the legs of a piano limbs and refer to a man's trousers as ineffables. My, how times change. Today, women also wear trousers, and hardly anything is ineffable, especially on late-night TV. Dictionaries note that ineffable may mean too sacred to be spoken, as the ineffable name of a deity or an ineffable curse. But this sense is now infrequent, and in current usage, ineffable almost always means inexpressible, unable to be expressed or described in words. Webster's New International Dictionary, 2nd edition, notes that ineffable usually applies to good or pleasant things, as ineffable beauty or ineffable joy, but it may occasionally apply to something unpleasant that is inexpressible, as ineffable disgust. Word 45. Stolid. S-T-O-L-I-D. Not easily moved, aroused, or excited. Showing little or no feeling or sensitivity. Mentally or emotionally dull, insensitive, or obtuse. 
Synonyms of stolid include unemotional, unresponsive, sluggish, apathetic, impassive, indifferent, and phlegmatic. Stolid comes from the Latin stolidus, stupid, dull, unmoving. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, Third College Edition, stolid applies to a person who is not easily moved or excited and suggests dullness, obtuseness, or stupidity. Unlike stoic people, who display firmness of mind and character in their thick-skinned, unflinching indifference to pain and suffering, people who are stolid are not easily moved because they are oafs, dolts, louts, or halfwits. In other words, a stolid person shows little feeling or sensitivity because the light's not on upstairs. Stolid is sometimes also applied figuratively to behavior or things that are unresponsive, insensitive, or not easily moved. A stolid countenance or expression is unresponsive. A stolid bureaucracy is dense and insensitive to the needs of individuals. Word 46. Awful. O-F-F-A-L. Waste. Garbage. Refuse. Rubbish. Awful comes from Middle English and is a combination of the words off and fall. Originally, the word applied to anything that fell off or was thrown off in the process of doing something. For example, wood chips in lumbering or carpentry, or the dross or scum that forms on the surface of molten metal. Since the early 1400s, Awful has also been used of the waste parts removed in the process of butchering an animal. From that unsavory sense, the meaning of awful broadened to denote waste or garbage in general, anything thrown away as worthless. In Julius Caesar, Shakespeare writes, What trash is Rome? What rubbish and what awful? Dictionaries still define awful as the waste parts, and especially the entrails of a butchered animal. And if you are fond of sausages, as I am, I hope it won't disturb you to know that many of them are made from awful. However, the more general definition of the word, trash, refuse, rubbish, is now probably more common. Today, we dispose of our awful in sewers and landfills, and the awful of sus- word 47. Lissom. L I S S. O-M-E. Limber, flexible, moving with ease and grace. Synonyms of lissom include nimble, agile, supple, and lithe. L-I-T-H-E. Lissom, lithe, and limber are close synonyms. Limber suggests moving or bending easily as limber muscles or a limber bow. Lithe and lissom suggest moving with nimbleness, agility, and grace. Of the two words, lithe is more literal, lissom more poetic. We speak of a lithe runner, a lithe deer, word 48. Mellifluous. M-E-L-L-I-F-L-U-O-U-S. Flowing smoothly and sweetly, like honey. The adjective mellifluous comes through Middle English from Latin and means literally flowing like honey. The word has stuck like honey to its root, and in modern usage, mellifluous means honeyed or honey-toned, flowing smoothly and sweetly. Mellifluous often applies to sounds or words, as a mellifluous voice, mellifluous music, a mellifluous speaker, or mellifluous word 49. Surfeit. S-U-R-F-E-I-T. To supply, fill, or feed to excess, especially to the point of discomfort, sickness, or disgust. Synonyms of surfeit include sate and satiate, which may mean either to fill or supply to satisfaction, 
or to fill or supply beyond what is necessary or desired. Additional synonyms include stuff, cram, glut, gorge, choke, inundate, and cloy. The verb to surfeit is derived from Middle English and Old French words meaning to overdo, exceed. And in modern usage, surfeit means to feed, fill, or stuff to the point of discomfort, sickness, or disgust. You can surfeit yourself on a Thanksgiving feast. You can surfeit yourself with booze. You can watch episodes of The Three Stooges until you are surfeited with slapstick humor. Or you can listen to Verbal Advantage until your brain is surfeited with words. The corresponding noun, surfeit, spelled and pronounced the same way, is most often used to mean an excess or oversupply, as a surfeit of praise, or a word 50. Blandishment. B-L-A-N-D-I-S-H-M-E-N-T. Flattering or coaxing speech or action. An ingratiating remark or gesture. Blandishment comes through Middle English and Old French from the Latin verb blandiri, to flatter, caress, coax, which comes in turn from the adjective blandus, which means flattering, fondling, caressing. By derivation, blandishment means speech or action that flatters, fondles, coaxes, or caresses in an attempt to win over or persuade a person. In current usage, the word is usually employed in its plural form, blandishments, which the second edition of Webster's New International Dictionary defines as soft words and artful caresses. Unlike flattery, which is generally perceived as self-serving, blandishments are not necessarily insincere. They may be expressions of honest affection, kindness, or desire. When you offer blandishments to your boss, to a friend, to your spouse, or to your lover, you are using gentle flattery and kind words to butter that person up. The corresponding verb is blandish, to coax with flattering or ingratiating statements or actions. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you the review word, followed by three words or phrases, and you decide which of those three words or phrases comes nearest the meaning of the review word. Are you ready? Let's begin. Is a sinecure, a period of unemployment, a job with many responsibilities, or a position that requires little or no work? A sinecure is a position that provides a good income or salary, but that requires little or no work. In colloquial terms, a cushy job. Is a predilection a preference, a dislike, or an uneasy feeling? A predilection is a preference, partiality, preconceived liking, an inclination or disposition to favor something is an imbroglio, a devious plot, a complicated situation, or an elaborate plan. An imbroglio is a complicated or intricate situation, a difficult, perplexing state of affairs. Also, a misunderstanding or disagreement of a complicated and confusing nature. Are ineffable feelings private, overwhelming, or inexpressible. Ineffable feelings are inexpressible. Ineffable means unable to be expressed or described in words. Is a stolid person unemotional, reliable, or stubborn? A stolid person is unemotional or unresponsive. Stolid means not easily moved, aroused, or excited, showing little or no feeling or sensitivity, mentally or emotionally dull, insensitive, or obtuse. Does awful mean immorality, 
to spare, or waste. Awful means waste, garbage, refuse, rubbish. If something is lissome, is it limber, delicious, or soft? Lissome means limber, flexible, moving with ease and grace. Are mellifluous words dishonest, smooth, or foolish? Mellifluous words are smooth and sweet. Mellifluous means flowing smoothly and sweetly, like honey. Does surfeit mean to shut down, to skip over, or to feed to excess? To surfeit means to supply, fill, or feed to excess, especially to the point of discomfort, sickness, or disgust. Does blandishment mean flattery, foolishness, or deceit? Blandishment means flattering or coaxing speech or action, an ingratiating remark or gesture. That concludes the review for this section and for Level 8. Remember to listen to this entire level again at least once before moving on to Level 9. Let's wind up Level 8 with a look at a few commonly mispronounced words. First, the word query, spelled Q-U-E-R-Y. The noun query means a question or inquiry. The verb to query means to ask questions about, especially to resolve a doubt or obtain authoritative information. The noun and verb are now so often mispronounced, query, or query, that these variants have made their way into a few current dictionaries. Until quite recently, however, dictionaries gave only one pronunciation, which I recommend as preferable. Query. Now let's look at consul and consulate. A consul, spelled C-O-N-S-U-L, is a diplomat a person appointed by a government to live in a foreign city and serve his country's citizens and business interests there. The word consulate, spelled C-O-N-S-U-L-A-T-E, refers either to the office or to the residence of a consul. These words are often mispronounced council and consulate, as if the first syllable were spelled C-O-U-N, instead of C-O-N. There is no council in consul and consulate, and these words have nothing to do with counseling. So the next time you journey abroad and need help from a representative of your government, go to the consulate and ask to see the consul. When you want to borrow a book, do you go to the public library or the public library? Let's hope you go to the public library because there is no such thing as a library. The beastly mispronunciation library is heard from less educated and very young speakers and is often criticized, says the second unabridged edition of the Random House Dictionary. Unless for some reason you wish to appear less educated or very young, remember there is no berry in library. Now for something irrelevant about jewelry that may help you avoid several grievous errors of pronunciation. Did you hear anything wrong with that sentence? I should hope so, because I made no fewer than four grievous errors of pronunciation, all of which are signs of a sloppy speaker. First, we have the problem of transposed letters and sounds. In the word irrelevant, be careful not to transpose the L and V and say irrelevant. I don't think I'm being irreverent by averring that the proper pronunciation is irrelevant. In the word jewelry, don't transpose the L and the E in the second syllable and say jewelry. There is no jula in jewelry. To get it right, just say the word jewel and then add re. By the way, in linguistics, this transposition of letters and sounds in a word is called metathesis, spelled M-E-T-A, 
T H E S I S. Next, we have grievous, which is often mispronounced grievous, even by educated speakers. These speakers are also prone to misspell the word by interpolating a spurious I, G R I E V I O U S. The correct spelling is G R I E V O U S, and the proper pronunciation has two, not three, syllables. Grievous. Now let's talk about pronunciation, which of course should be pronunciation. I can't tell you how many times I have been a guest on a radio talk show, fielding questions on language, when someone calls in to complain about some horrendous mispronunciation and rail about how people mispronunciate words. Alas, modern medicine has yet to discover a cure for beotian ears, which you may recall is an eponymous expression for ears unable to appreciate poetry or music. There is no noun in pronunciation, but there is a nun. P R O N U N C I A T I O N. And there are also no such verbs as pronunciate or mispronunciate. Listen to me carefully now, so you can be sure to avoid these egregious errors of speech. You either pronounce a word properly. Or you mispronounce it. When you pronounce words properly, you have good pronunciation, and when you mispronounce them, you are guilty of mispronunciation. If you want to hear rampant mispronunciation, all you have to do is turn on your radio or television. Lately, I have heard numerous broadcasters mispronounce the words siege, refuge, and refugee. Instead, they say siege, refuge, and refugee. The problem here is the letter G, which should sound like the G in cage and regiment, not like the G in collage. Be careful to say siege, refuge, and refugee. Also acceptable is refugee, with the accent on the first syllable. How do you pronounce the word spelled? S U C C I N C T. What about the word spelled F L A C C I D? If you say succinct and flaccid, go directly to the library. Do not pass go and learn how not to mispronunciate your words. If you said succinct and flaccid, you have my eternal gratitude and respect. Did you catch that hyperbolic use of the word "eternal"? Now, why are succinct and flaccid correct? You ask. Because the rule for pronouncing double C in a word says that the first C sounds like K, the second like S. Together, they create the sound of KS, as in the name Jackson. Thus, we say accident, not accident. Accept. Not accept, and eccentric, not eccentric. The same rule holds for succinct, brief, concise, and flaccid, soft and limp, and that goes for the word accessory too. Don't let me catch you saying accessory. If I do, it won't be an accident when I terminate your success with this program by flogging you until you're flaccid. Since we both know that if I did that to you, I would go directly to jail without passing go, it seems fitting to conclude this expatiation on pronunciation by covering three words pertaining to the legal profession: juror, vendor, and defendant. In the courtroom, pompous lawyers and judges often pronounce these words: juror, vendor, and defendant, and many members of the laity are now imitating them. It's over-refined and pretentious to say juror, vendor, and defendant when the common everyday pronunciations have been heard for centuries and are intelligible to everyone. There is no need to over-pronounce these words. Say juror, vendor, and defendant. Remember, I'm giving you all this good advice because proper pronunciation is my fort. 
That's right, I mean fort, not forte, or worse, forte. The musical term, spelled F-O-R-T-E, comes from Italian and is pronounced in two syllables, like the Italian, forte. Forte is a musical direction meaning loud, as opposed to piano, which means soft. Now, when you use the word spelled F-O-R-T-E to mean a strong point, specialty, something at which a person excels, it should be pronounced in one syllable, fort. The English fort comes from a French word spelled F-O-R-T, which means strong and is also pronounced in one syllable, but without the T sound at the end. If you doubt my word about fort, check a dictionary, or two, or five, and you will see that for the meaning strong point, specialty, fort is preferred by all authorities, past and present. If you'd like to learn about more beastly mispronunciations you should avoid, allow me to recommend my two books on the subject, There Is No Zoo in Zoology, and Is There a Cow in Moscow, both published by Collier Macmillan. You should be able to find them at your local public library. And with that flaccid bit of self-promotion, we come to the end of Level 8. By now, your head should be surfeited with importunate admonitions on usage and pronunciation and overflowing with brave new words. I also hope that your dictionary is beginning to show some signs of wear and tear. Before moving on to the most difficult words in the course, you may want to spend some extra time reviewing, just to make sure you have assimilated all the keywords and additional information and are well prepared for the erudite and abstruse vocabulary in levels 9 and 10.